Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is piston pumps. Our objective is to examine a common hydraulic pump known as a piston pump. We'll examine its principle of operation and identify internal components that make it function. This lecture operates under the assumption you've watched the hydraulic pumps, gear pumps, and vein pumps lectures, all available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched these lectures yet or only dimly recall their contents, please take the time to do so now. Recall that three types of positive displacement pumps are commonly employed in hydraulic systems. Gear pumps, vein pumps, and piston pumps. Pumps are mechanical power to fluid power converters. Pumps, regardless of their type, can be classified as fixed or variable displacement pumps. A fixed displacement pump, as the name implies, is incapable of varying displacement per revolution. A variable displacement pump, in contrast, uses movable internal components to selectively increase or decrease displacement per revolution as required. Gear pumps use a pair of equally sized meshing gears to provide pressurized flow to a hydraulic system. All gear pumps are fixed displacement pumps. Vein pumps can either be fixed or variable displacement pumps depending upon construction. A vein pump uses a slotted rotor and extendable veins that scrape the inside of a cam ring. A fixed displacement vein pump keeps the relationship between the rotor and cam ring constant whereas a variable displacement vein pump varies the position of the cam ring or rotor to vary displacement per revolution. Piston pumps can either be fixed or variable displacement pumps depending upon construction. A piston pump uses an angled plate to position pistons inside a rotating piston block. A fixed displacement piston pump keeps the angle constant, whereas a variable displacement piston pump varies the angle to vary displacement per revolution. The intention of this lecture is to examine the internal construction and discuss the principles of operation of piston pumps only. Other lectures at the Big Bad Tech channel examine gear and vein pumps. Piston pumps, in addition to being categorized as fixed or variable displacement, can either be axial, bent axis, radial, or rotating cam radial piston pumps. We'll start with the axial piston pump, since they're the easiest. Before we begin, let me define the terms axial and radial, since we'll be using them a lot. Axial means in line with a drive shaft, like an axle, whereas radial means radiating away from the drive shaft, like the radius of a circle. An axial piston pump features a drive shaft to which an angled plate called a swash plate is affixed. Pistons are attached to the swash plate and the pistons are housed inside a piston block that is also affixed to the drive shaft. A housing or body encapsulates these parts and a port plate with an inlet and outlet port covers one end. Note I'm pronouncing it swash plate, not squash plate. Don't be the person that demolitions a perfectly good interview by telling a prospective employer all about squash plates. The principal operation of a piston pump is just like any other positive displacement pump. However, since there's a bunch of parts moving relative to one another, it's a little difficult to conceptualize and depict especially on a two-dimensional screen. I'll do my best. Additionally, we'll take apart some real piston pumps at the end of this lecture so you can see how they really three-dimensionally hook together. Recall that a positive displacement pump is one characterized by a clear and definite separation between the inlet and outlet ports, and one cycle of a positive displacement pump can be described as a suction phase, where the inlet sees a region of increasing volume and a compression and exhaust phase where the outlet sees a region of decreasing volume. First and foremost, the swash plate inside an axial piston pump does not wobble back and forth as you might initially expect. For this application, consider the swash plate being held at a fixed angle to the drive shaft. Let's call this the axial offset. Additionally, note the piston block is also affixed to the drive shaft and rotates with it. Without the pistons and piston blocks complicating the picture, as the drive shaft rotates in one direction, the swash plate and piston block rotate with it, and the pistons affixed to the swash plate create regions of changing volume inside the barrels of the piston block. Long story short, the swash plate's only purpose is to create a volume differential at the opposite ends of the drive shaft's circular path. If you think about this from the perspective of a single piston traveling the full 360 degree circle, an individual piston is in effect acting just like a manual piston pump. 
the upstroke of the piston creates a region of increasing volume and executes the suction phase. The downstroke of the piston forms a region of decreasing volume and executes the compression and exhaust phase. When we think of this as a collective of pistons, note we have in effect six manual piston pumps all executing the same cycle sequentially offset from each other. As the drive shaft spins the complete assembly, the swashplate pistons and piston block, piston after piston follows in succession. Axial piston pumps with a collection of pistons, in contrast to a manual piston pump with one piston, therefore serve to ensure at least half the collective is firing while the other half is reloading, an excellent strategy for both pumps that desire to smooth pulsations and when confronted by a swarm of zombies. Note I've drawn six pistons in this diagram to keep things simple. However, most piston pumps are manufactured with an odd number of pistons. Note the axial offset of the swashplate from the drive shaft determines the volume of fluid introduced to the system each turn of the drive shaft and each cycle of the pump. If the swashplate angle were remained fixed, this would make a fixed displacement piston pump. If, however, the angle of the swashplate and drive shaft can be varied, this would make this a variable displacement piston pump. Variable displacement piston pumps often use a spring and piston combination to adjust the angle of the swashplate, similar to the method employed by variable displacement vane pumps when varying the offset between the rotor and cam ring. When the piston exerts less force than the spring, the swashplate is held at a maximum angle and volume differential between the top of the upstroke and the bottom of the downstroke is at a maximum. Displacement per revolution is at a maximum, and flow rate is maximum. When the piston exerts increasing force, the swashplate is held at less of an angle, and volume differential between the top of the upstroke and the bottom of the downstroke decreases. Displacement per revolution decreases, and flow rate decreases. Finally, when the piston exerts equal force as the spring, the swashplate is no longer held at an angle, and there exists no volume differential between the top of the upstroke and the bottom of the downstroke. Displacement per revolution is zero, and flow stops. In summary, maximum angle, maximum flow. Less angle, less flow, no angle, no flow. Simply by varying the angle of the swashplate, a variable displacement piston pump can vary the displacement per revolution and directly control flow rate. Note. Otherwise reputable textbooks often depict variable displacement piston pumps with a maximum negative angle as having no flow. This is wrong with a capital R, because a swashplate held at a maximum negative angle would produce maximum reverse flow. Remember, maximum angle, maximum flow, less angle, less flow, no angle, no flow. Additionally, note the spring and piston pair on opposite ends of the swashplate is not the only method used to vary the angle. Some advanced variable displacement piston pumps use solenoids, a type of linear electrical actuator to electrically position the angle of the swashplate with great accuracy and control. Let's now briefly examine another type of piston pump known as a bent axis piston pump. A bent axis piston pump is really just a variation on the axial piston pump. A bent axis piston pump rather than having a swashplate held at an angle to the drive shaft, has a swashplate held at a fixed right angle to the drive shaft. However, the drive shaft is now held at an angle to the piston block. From the perspective of the piston block, the swashplate still appears at an angle and the pistons still execute the suction phase in the upstroke and the compression and exhaust phase on the downstroke. If the drive shaft's angle to the piston block is fixed, this would be a fixed displacement bent axis piston pump. If, however, the drive shaft's angle to the piston block could be varied, this would be a variable displacement bent axis piston pump following the same principle. Maximum angle, maximum flow. Less angle, less flow. No angle, no flow. A bent axis piston pump is immediately recognizable as one having a noticeable bent axis, as one would expect. Finally, Consider a radically different type of piston pump that you may never have time or occasion to run across, the radial piston pump. The radial piston pump is what happens when an unbalanced vane pump and an axial piston pump have a baby. Quite like an unbalanced vane pump, it features an off-center rotor inside a cam ring. The vanes, however, have been replaced with pistons, and the rotor is essentially a piston block 
with pistons that reciprocate radially in and out of it as opposed to axially or in line with the drive shaft. If the rotor piston block combination were to rotate counterclockwise, pistons on the lower half of the pintle would be executing the suction phase and pistons on the upper half of the pintle would be executing the compression and exhaust phase. Another variation on radial piston pumps you may never, never have time or occasion to run across is known as a rotating cam radial piston pump. This type of piston pump has the pistons and piston block externally surrounding a central rotating cam. As the cam rotates, it sequentially reciprocates the pistons. As the cam rotates in the counterclockwise direction, due to the eccentricity of the cam, half the pistons would experience regions of increasing volume and execute the suction phase, and the other half of the pistons would experience decreasing volume and execute the compression and exhaust phase of a positive displacement pump. These last two types of piston pumps, the radial piston pump, the rotating cam radial piston pump, aren't nearly as popular as axial and bent axis piston pumps, and you may never run across them, but I thought I'd include them in this basic discussion on the odd chance you do run into one. All right, that's about it for the basic internal construction and operation of piston pumps. Let's disassemble some axial piston pumps and see if we can identify some of the constituent parts. Here's an example of an axial piston pump. We can see the drive shaft, the housing or body, and some ports. When we pop off the top half of the housing, we can see the drive shaft and the valleys of a semicircular rocker mechanism into which the swash plate sits. The bottom half of the housing contains the piston block, pistons, and swash plate. Note the pump is missing a spring on one side of the swash plate. I happen to know exactly who took this pump apart last time, and by the time you graduate, they might be out of the push-up position by then. Note the swash plate is linked to a movable piston and features the other half of the rocker mechanism. As the piston linked to the swash plate extends and retracts, the angle of the swash plate changes, making this a variable displacement axial piston pump. We can remove the mechanical linkage, and then remove the piston block, pistons, and swash plate. We can now see how the angle of the swash plate affects displacement value per revolution. When the swash plate is held at an angle, a volume differential exists inside the piston block as the drive shaft is rotated 360 degrees. When the swash plate angle is at a maximum, flow rate is at a maximum. In contrast, when the swash plate is held flat, no volume differential exists and flow rate is at a minimum. We can remove the pistons from the piston block. Note the ball and socket assembly on the pistons allow them to swivel with respect to the swash plate and still reciprocate axially inside the piston block. The data sheet for this particular variable displacement axial piston pump is a wealth of information. It can be utilized as a regular pressure compensated variable displacement axial piston pump, a load sensing variable displacement axial piston pump, a constant horsepower variable displacement axial piston pump, and it includes the ability to electrically position the angle of the swash plate. Additionally, the data sheet includes the mother of all pump performance charts. On one chart, it displays several important curves as a function of pressure. Volumetric efficiency and overall efficiency use the percentage vertical scale on the far right. As we expect, volumetric efficiency goes down at higher pressures since more leakage occurs. Overall efficiency starts out pretty low at low pressures and then levels out, maybe around 90%. Output flow rate uses the vertical scale on the far left in units of liters per minute. As we'd expect, flow rate goes down at higher pressures given increased leakage and the tendency of the nominal rotational speed of the prime mover to decrease given higher torque requirements at higher pressures. Input power also uses the vertical scale at the far left in units of kilowatts. As we'd expect, the input power requirement increases at higher pressures. Additionally, note the chart includes another curve for input power requirement when the pump has reached the firing pressure and has entered the high pressure standby mode, in this particular manufacturer's vernacular, when the pump is deadheaded. A deadheaded pump maintains pressure, however, produces no flow. As we'd expect, the input power requirement to maintain the high pressure standby mode goes up as pressure increases. Finally, the data sheet includes another useful chart, that of the flow rate of the case drain at different pressure requirements. Again, for two scenarios, one when the pump is producing flow 
than again when the pump is in high pressure standby mode. As we'd expect, the case drain flow increases at higher pressures due to increased leakage. Note the dramatic difference between the two curves. When the pump is producing flow, the case drain isn't carrying as much flow since most of the flow should be outbound to the system. However, when the pump reaches the firing pressure and enters high pressure standby mode, the case drain flow dramatically increases. The point of this chart is to remind you that case drain flow isn't just an occasional drip, drip, drip that can be ignored, but rather a real and substantial flow path that must be accounted for. Before I let you go, here's the internal workings of yet another variable displacement axial piston pump that employs a slightly different method of varying the swashblade angle. One half of the housing features a piston. The other half of the housing features a piston and piston block sitting on top of the swashblade. When we remove the pistons and piston block, we can see the swashplate being acted upon by a spring. The piston in the other half of the housing basically counteracts the spring force at the same point. When the two opposing forces are equal, the swashplate is held flat and flows at a minimum. When the spring exerts more force and the piston less, the swashplate is held at an increasing angle and flow increases. Here's the pistons and piston block. When the swashplate is held at a maximum angle, a volume differential exists and flow is at a maximum. When the swash blade is held flat, no volume differential exists and flow is at a minimum. We can remove the pistons from the piston block. Here's one side of the piston block and then the other. Here's the pistons and the carrier. Again, note the ball and socket mechanism allows the pistons to swivel with respect to the swash plate and still reciprocate axially inside the piston block. Here's an individual piston removed from the carrier. There you have it the internal workings of axial piston pumps, truly horrifying in their complexity. All right, that's about it. Other lectures examine gear and vane pumps that exhibit notable differences in construction, operation, and performance. In conclusion, this lecture examined both fixed and variable displacement axial, bent axis, radial, and rotating cam radial piston pumps. We discussed the concept of operation, examined their inner workings, and identified constituent parts. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.